everyone. So here we are with Matt Collum. And Matt, we're super excited to see your workshop and thank you so much for inviting us in. Uh, you know, so many people uh, really want to know, how do you make a slip joint folder? Very few people know how to do this. And so Matt's going to show us some tips today and especially as you assemble one of the Waterville, yes, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. So, and thank you so much for yeah. participating in the Waterville Collection. 2023 is our first year. Yes, sir. And I remember meeting Matt at the uh, Atlanta Blade show and I invited right. you to make one of our first year knives. Yes, sir. And you were excited about it. Very that. excited. Very excited to be involved in because of the history and you bringing something back to life and you're selecting hand makers. So I'm very honored to be one of your first of the year. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And, you know, Waterville is one of the, the oldest brands ever in the U.S., going back as far as 1843. And, and now to be able to bring that back and honor that history, but we're honoring history with some of the best custom slip joint knife makers in the United States. And uh, this is the way they used to do it back in the old yes, days. Yes, sir. Sure did. They sure did. So come with us as we go into uh, Matt's shop. And we're going to take a look around, and then he's going to show us some of the processes of making a slip joint folder. Well, come on in. This, by the way, is one of the cleanest knife shops you'll ever see. <laughs> and I see, Matt, you got drill presses. Yep. We got drill presses for uh, different size holes, different reaming. Um, try to have a tool per job. Yeah, so yep. it's almost like you have your own uh, assembly line where you take yep. a knife through a process. To a sense, yes. Mm -hmm. No, that way I can repeat the process and be accurate and uh, also be up to speed, not waste a lot of time changing tools. You know, I always wonder uh, because it's so much sometimes trial and error. I mean, oh yeah. How do you yeah. have the patience to like? What if you make a mistake? Do you just have you learned it's just better to start over? There's some things that are fixable, and then also knowing that there might be a mistake, it's not worth trying to, to recover. If it's going to compromise the knife, then you need to just scratch it and start over. But for me, that's why I do pocket knives. Um, the excitement of knowing that, hey, I can do something and mess this up. So to me, that gives me a challenge to try to do the best I can through the whole project and uh, ultimately to come out with a, a good quality product. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. and, I, and I know, Matt, he's he's – values his own brand, right? I mean, he makes custom knives for people literally all over the world. So when you put the column name on there, yes, you want it to be a finished yes, product that works and is right. So, because you told me you if something don't go right, you don't put it out there. No, 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 no. We got to throw it away and start over. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's what I like. And at, in the Waterville collection, one of the things that, yeah. that really appealed to me, and I approached Matt, because you know, you're a young guy yes, or a sir. knife maker, but you've yep. been doing this for 20 years. Well, yeah, I'd say off and on, yeah, 20 years, you know. Started when I was younger, um, did it till I was about, mm, about 18, 19, and I got out of it. And uh, then I picked it back up um, late at 2018 and hit it really hard, you know, produced yeah. a lot of knives and got a lot of knives out there. Yeah, yeah. So, and your grandpa got you started. That is correct. Uh, my grandfather, he was making pocket knives, and uh, that's where I – learned it from yeah. so it, it was just a a tremble down effect of watching him and learning with him and then building with him and now building on the stage that i'm building on that i never would have thought i'd be involved in and you were what 12 years old when you my made first, your first one first yes. night yes. first night when he was 12 years old yeah. so it wasn't the best one but it was, <laughs> it, it was something to be proud of there are some good yeah. ones now folks and yeah. listen if you want a custom knife made call matt he can really help you out you could even uh have you ever had somebody like send you something um, to, to put on as a handle, maybe a piece of their own family history or something like yeah, that? Yeah, I've actually, I, um, I had a guy, uh, his mother reached out to me for his for a birthday present coming up and uh, his granddad had passed away and him and his granddad was real close. So they sent me some antlers that his granddad had killed on a buck and uh I used them antlers for his handles. So that was a surprise for him for his birthday. He oh, wow. Got a little bit of his grandfather's history and something special to him. And now it's on a knife in his pocket every day. So yeah. we will do things like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Matt's just really good at making old patterns and a lot of the old things that you would see and, and creating some of his own patterns. And for us at Waterville, we're actually doing one of your own patterns, the that Cap Muskrat, yeah. which we're super excited <gasps> about. 
but blending that new design that you have with those ebony wood handles and the bar shield, yeah, it's a nice. And look. that was one of the things that really uh, piqued my interest to you is wanting one of my patterns. Uh, yeah. So that felt like a big honor to me, and just the neat history of the knife company itself. Uh, yeah. Really excited, really excited yeah. about it. Yeah. So here we go. We're going to get started, and thanks for joining us on Knife Maker Profiles. Hey everybody, so this is a finished Waterville capped muskrat that I've got completed. Show you what it looks like. So we have my clip point blade on the main side, and then we have the Warncliffe blade on the secondary side. So there's the finished product. So today we're going to go through and we're going to show y'all how I build these things. All right, so we're fixing to go ahead now and get the liners cleaned up. So we'll be one step closer to getting this thing pinged together. Okay, so we have our two handles, and they're already ready. We got our bolsters on, we got our shield in, we got our pins in. And I went ahead and took our bolsters up to somewhat 90% finished. We have our spring here. We have our main blade. We have our secondary blade. Now, we already got the blades cleaned up. But what we need to do now is clean up the spring. This marking here is so I know which way the spring goes in the frame of the knife. So now let's take our spring and our handles and go get them cleaned up to ready to be peened together. What are you doing there? I was just cleaning off my marker um, where I had it marked on there. So I just sprayed a little acetone to get the marker off of the liners. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we moved into the lapping table. Now I use this cardboard for two purposes. Um, mostly to protect the stone because it can get damaged real easy if a piece of metal falls on it. And also I can put my parts up here and find them pretty easy. So now I'll cut me some 600 grit lathing paper. This paper's got sticky back, so it makes it really easy. You're not having to uh, put an adhesive down and then scrape an adhesive up. Um, this makes the job a lot easier. So I just cut me a piece off. And then just stick it down. And then good old trusted 409, stone and steel. So now sometimes this paper will try to roll up a little bit on you, but that's okay. So now we're going to clean the flats up on our liners. Um, we want the scratches all running one way. So you're going to see, I'm going to come in and work this in the center pretty good, and then I'll come back with some straight pulls. It all just takes time and attention to detail, doesn't it, Matt? Yes, sir. That's it. Just not getting in too big of a rush. And if you see you see, you got something, don't think it's okay and try to pass by it. Sometimes twist it a lot and uh, keep addressing it until you get the problem fixed. Because if you see it now, you're really going to see it later. Okay, so we got that cleaned up. So now we're just going to do some straight pulls. And all we're going to do is just blend the scratches in right here. That's all we're doing. So we got our, our pull our line straight in there. Now we'll move and do our next one the exact same way. Give it a good look over. There's a little bit of something right there, so... And you're only cleaning the part that's visible? So yes. Yeah, the part the, where the bolsters are going? And that's right. So right up under here, um, I'll hit that on the straight pulls. Um, we'll clean the relief part up later. But this right here will not, won't be seen. It's clean, but it, it's got a little uh, heat stain on it. But that's going to be totally fine. You won't be able to see it when it's together. And it won't affect the action of the knife one bit. You actually, if you tend to these too much, what will happen is when you paint this knife together, it'll push that blade. So you got to be really careful about touching your surface points of your action. Now we're going to do straight pulls again. We're going to look at it. Still got a little bit there, so we're going to go back and Okay. 
and I'm being real careful because I don't want to sand too much where the blades actually pivot because it will alter the direction of the blades. All right, so now we got our spring. Um, we still have to clean up in here, but at this stage we can only lap our flats. So that's what we'll do now. You'll see me doing cycles like this. And ideally, you want a spring about a thousandths thinner than your blades. It'll help your springs float pretty easy. Gives you a good action. Helps with the action. So I'm going to get that good and polished up. Flip it over and do the other side the same way. Now notice I've got the paper war right here. So this 600 grit here is probably actually turned into a thousand grit. It's no longer 600 here, mm -hmm. but right here with the paper still fresh, that's 600 grit. So we want to go and springs really don't matter, but I still do it anyways. Good, good practice. I want to be on fresh side of 600 grit when I do my straight pulls to blend my scratches. And I'll do two or three runs of it, but notice I'm not where I wore the paper out at. I'm on fresh side of it. And when you talk about blending your scratches, you're really putting the satin finish on, right? Yes, sir. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, so if you can imagine, you start with scratches at maybe, um, you start, let's just say you start at 80 grit and you progress your way up. So we'll go 80 and then we'll progress to 120. And all you're doing is changing them scratches from an 80 to a 120 to a 220. And then we'll move on to, I go from 220 to 600 um, you have to be really careful when you come off your grinder and make sure you get your blades ground real well or you'll find yourself doing a lot of hand sanding or going back to your grinder. So you're basically just trading your scratches in for finer scratches and you just progress up through your grit. So now we got our springs and our liners clean. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move in and uh, back into the clean room. We'll come out of the dust room and we're going to clean up our spring on the inside. All right, so we're going to go ahead and set our jig up. Um, to take our muskrat. So I'll use this jig on all of my knives. Um, but basically I can preset this to whatever pattern I'm building. And it's just got pucks on here and um, different holes. And it can fit multiple knives. And uh, actually one of my good friends up in Oklahoma designed this jig. Now this is a remake of one of our friends named Nicholas out of Louisiana. Um, he got permission from Ricky to make them. And uh, this, is, this is his jig. So, a very, very important jig. Um, it's, it's really, you don't have to have it, but if you want to make quality knives, this is a must for zeroing out knives. And general fit up gets you an idea. A lot of people will tell you it's for setting the walk and talk, uh, but that's a very minor situation for this jig. This is really a, a real must have for a quality knife maker. So, now that we got our jig set up, what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and get our back spring cleaned up like I told you earlier. So now we'll move that part and get it cleaned up. So now we're ready for our next step of uh, cleaning up our back spring. Now I want to start off and say, this is how I do things. Now, other knife makers are going to do things different, um, but ultimately we're all trying to get to the same finished product of uh, producing a high quality knife. So, um, Take my information, these little tips, with a grain of salt. If it helps you, uh, that'll be great. But also I want to point out that we can't show you everything, uh, so much going into making a knife, but we're going to touch on some major key components of knife building that I believe um, and kind of give you a little lesson on them. So we're going to come in and we're going to look at the spring, and I want to explain something to y'all before we go ahead and clean this spring up. But Todd, if you can come in and uh, look at this spring right here with us, I want y'all to notice... This right little area right here, now you see where that blade, that is where the tang of this knife. So this is your back square, and this is your front, I'm sorry, this is your back torque point and your front torque point. And what's happening, if you look at this spring here, this little area is called your wall. And that is where your blade rides on this spring. And you'll see a line right here. And that is where your kick of your blade gets here. But I want you to notice that my walk is in the center of my spring. Now you'll see at times a walk will be all the way to one side and not on the other side. But now if this tang is full size, there's no catch bit in here, it's full size of spring, you should have be dead in the center or 
rubbed all the way across. Now I taper mine so I get no rub. It gets a good float. So that's why you see here that my walk is in the center of my springs. So if you're ever making knives, that's something you want to look for. You want to look and see where your walk is rubbing. And if you're in the center, you're doing great. So now we're going to move on and we're going to clean up this back spring right here because this will be visible. Now these marks here, they're always going to be there. It's just part of the knife rotating. So that's why also it's important to keep your pocket knives oiled. You don't want metal and metal rubbing all the time with no oil. So now we'll move on and we'll clean this spring up. Alright, so I just use the simple things you might have around the shop. So I use a ceramic rod. This is actually just for honing a cutting edge on a pocket knife. And I have a racer here. And I'll show you how I do it. I'll take my 220 grit paper. Now I'm not worried about getting in here and scratching my walks. We're going to clean them back up. So I'll take some 409. We'll spray a little bit on there. And I'm just going to clean these scratches up. If you look, you'll see where it's starting to blend everything in. But this is 220. So now I'm going to do full strokes. And I'm going to wear this paper out on this spring. I'll move over and do it one more time with fresh part of the paper. Okay, now we'll move to 600 grit. So this is 600 grit. And you can see now the spring's starting to look good. All right, so we'll wipe that off. And now we'll do some straight pulls with a rubber back. And what that's going to do is that's going to blend our scratches. We get up another piece of 600. We got our, I use a racer. So any kind of rubber would work or a racer. I found the racer works good for me. I'm actually going to turn this. So while I got the knife like this too, I want to address my walk. And what I'm going to do with my walk is I'm going to do straight pulls, but I'm going to use 220. Some guys use 180 or 220. The reason we do that is we take our tanks to a high polish, but our walk, we leave a little rough. And that ideal is it'll hold the oil, so the oil will stay in your blade longer. But if this is a high polish and your tank's a high polish, your oil won't stick. So we're just going to do straight pulls. Now all we're doing is putting a scratch, 220 scratch pattern in it. Do the other side as well. Okay, so we got no scratches in there. Alright, so that's how we address the spring. Alright, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and prep our handles for the pins. We're going to ream our holes. And this is what's going to give our, when we pin the pins in, this is what's going to allow the swell room to lock this knife together. So, I use a carbide deburr. It's just a simple 1 8 deburr that tapers down to a 16th. And this is the part number. In case anybody might want to get one. It's an 18053 and it is made by SGS. It's a really good reamer. So I just use my drill. If you use a drill, it's important to make sure you're going in square. So what I do is I come in, I watch the back of my liner and I try to center up in my hole because I want that pin to swell center. And I just get a little burr raised on it. The camera might not be able to pick that up. But it is just a little burr. So now we're going to do all three holes in each handle. Now when you go to the handle material, be careful because this rimmer will eat out fast. 
We're going to hit this one just a little. Well, I, I believe that's good. And I will do the repeat the process the exact same way. Notice that I'm centered at the back. I don't know how much it matters, but to me it feels like it matters a lot, so I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. Don't need a lot. You just need enough for that pin to swell. So now we are ready to assemble this knife and get ready to paint it together. That'll be the next step. Alright, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use tape. Um, I'm going to put it on my bevels of my knife. And this just prevents me from scratching it, and it also serves another purpose later. Once I get it pinned together, I'll use this tape to help hold the blade to break it in. Um, so that's a, that's a little tip, a little trick that helps out. Um, if you don't do this, you ought to try it. It also saves you from having to go back and redo it in your hand satin on your blades. So we want the tips. Notice I got the tips not covered. Now a multi-blade is not as important if you're only doing two blades and an offset grind. But if you're, say, building a single blade, you can look at that tip when you're painting this knife together and you can see where that tip lands. So that's why I leave my tips exposed. Uh, but yes, I could get a scratch there. So now what we're going to do is set this up on our, our Minfi jig. Now I did blow these holes out off camera, a little loud for camera. But I blow these holes out so my pins can go in there with no problem. Um, if I left all that grit in there from... Reaming them, it could obstruct the uh, pins and crack handles when I try to slide them through. So it's best just to clean up everything really nice. So now we're going to move to our jig. Okay, we're now ready to move on to our next step. We have our knife on the jig. Um, you might notice these. I'm using this as a shim stock, and this is just 5,000 thick stainless. So what I do is I put it under the spring. And then ultimately when that blade's sitting there, it'll give me a little buffer room. So also you might notice there's grease here. Now this is a little tip and trick, something I do. I put a little grease in my pivot holes. So now I'm going to go ahead and assemble this knife on the frame. we got to make sure we wipe the grease off the pin. We do not want that grease getting in the bolster. So we're going to wipe the excess off the pin. That's a significant tip. Yes. Right? Yes, because when you go to paint this thing together, you don't want no you don't want no um grease in between your pin and the bolster. It can help show your pin. So excess grease we're going to take off. Then just do a quick wipe down. All right. Now we are ready for our other handle. We got to be careful we don't bust our material here. So work it down. Okay. So now we have it together. We'll pull it off of our jig. Here the knife is. So now we have a knife ready to be peened. So we're going to cut our pins off relatively close. This is 332nd pin stop. All right, so now what we'll do is we'll go and sand these down. A good rule of thumb is having half the thickness of the pin sticking above your handle material so you have enough room, enough material to swell that pin in that cavity that we made earlier when we reamed it. So now we'll go to the grinder. All right, Matt, so we're moving into the grinding phase. Tell us tell us what you're doing. Okay, so as you said, we moved into the grinding stage. We are in the dust room now. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these pins down and get them a little closer to our handle material 
If we have too much excess pin, what will happen is when we start painting this, these pins will bend. And uh, it will really just, overall, you won't be able to hide your pins, and you're more than likely going to crack your handle material and not get it good and tight. So now we'll go to our grinder, and we'll clean these pins up. We want to be careful that we don't hit our handle material on here just yet. We just want to take the pins down. So I'm going to adjust some of these pins where I can get a good flat face on them. Now I like leaving my faces flat when I paint them. Some guys will taper their pins. In theory, it'll the center will go down and mash the outside out. So I'm just being real careful here. And if you want to get in, Todd, and let them see that. So basically, I just took my pin down. And now we'll do the rest of them the same way. Now, being careful not to get it too hot. That's a good practice, especially if you're working with vintage micarta. It'll burn your micarta and discolor. So we're just going to take it down. We'll do our other bolster. So this side is ready. Now we need to do the exact same thing to the other side of the knife. I'm going to check it, make sure I'm pushed in pretty good. We do know we're held five thousandths out because of the shim stop. All right, we got that one cleaned up. Let it cool. We have that one now cleaned up, and we're going to do the last one. So now we're ready to move to painting it together. Okay, so now we're ready to paint our knife together. Um, I'm going to put it on my little steady anvil I have here. I have a couple hammers. I have a chasing hammer here. I recently acquired this little ball peen hammer. And then I just have a regular flat face hammer. Now I'll use this hammer on my bolsters. I like to use it on my bolsters. And you're going to see I'm going to smack it down a certain way versus doing my handle. Pin. So we'll get started on that right now. So basically, I'm just letting that pin touch the anvil, not my handle, on the other side. I start developing a head. I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to start developing a head on this side. I'm going to check it and see how tight it is on my shim stop. Still a little loose. I'm going to look at it real good. I'm going to come in and tighten up a little more. Okay, we got that good and tight. We'll pull our shim stock out. And now I have five thousandths of play in this blade. We don't want that, so we're going to address that right now and tighten it on up some more. Now I'm just checking it. We got it good and tight. We got our action. Got a blade set in there. So now I'm going to tighten it up a little bit in a closed position. Be careful doing this. All right. We will move to the next one. Using the round end, 
Yes, sir. So I'm using the, the ballpoint, and it's able, I'm able to focus where I'm pushing this material. So I want a uniformed hole. I want my pen to be uniformed and fill that hole up nicely. I don't want my pins oblong. So sometimes I'll flip back and forth to the big side, and that allows me to swell the whole pin at one. And then I'll flip back over to the other side if i got to fill in a certain spot to even the pin out. So I'm going to start rolling it down just a little bit. So now we'll flip it back over. We're going to take it down a little bit more. And now I'm just kind of dancing around the end of the pin, making sure I get it seated real good. If you look, you'll notice I've rolled this pin a little more to the end. I want to make sure I fill up all that cavity, but not go too far. So what are you doing there, Matt? I'm checking to see, making sure my pin is seated evenly all the way around my handle material. So I want my pins to be perfectly round when we sand these off. I don't want my pen to be oblong in the handle material and show a cavity. So it's just a fine line of painting it right and not painting it too much. So I see some of the places I need to address now. Hello everyone. So it's it's been what a blessing it's been for Matt to just show us some of his processes. Of course, there's so many processes that go into making a knife and a lot that he had done before I even we even got here to his shop. But he has showed us some of those and now it's pinned together and he's got to walk and talk. And it's amazing just looking at the back spring and the blade where it comes together. It's just as smooth as it can be. And he's still got more to do there to fine tune it. But the detail, the attention to detail and the time it takes to get it just right is amazing. And so it's, it's, it's of course, I got the blue tape, but you can still hear the, uh, the pop. And, of course, I like the way the blue tape is there. It keeps me from cutting my finger. Um, beautiful. And so very excited for this to be part of the 2023 Waterville Collection, our first year. And this is going to be a beautiful knife. There's going to be 10 of them. We have a limited edition of 10 handmade custom Waterville cutlery knives by Matt Collum. Okay, we're ready for the next step. We're going to get our back spring, the, the whole spine of the knife. We're going to try to get it cleaned up and get all of our scratches running one way. So we recently, in the last step, we had it pinned together. So now we're going to move on to the next step. I'm going to start with a 220 grit belt on my horizontal. And we'll do that now. On the 600? Yes, so now we'll be at 600 grit. We just done the spine of the knife at 220, so we're going to progress up in our grit.
So here's what it's like with the 220. So now we'll go to 600 and we'll clean the 220 grit scratches out. Okay, so we got the back of our spine cleaned up. I want you to notice, Todd, if you will come in here and look. We still got the head of these pins on here. This is going to be pretty much one of the last steps uh, is taking the head of the pins off. Some of you might know it, might not know it, but we need to break this knife in. And how we do that is we're going to oil this blade real good, and we're going to sit here and work this knife, and we're going to get this knife functioning the way it should work. And we call that breaking a knife in. But we're going to start with the Warncliffe blade. Spray a little oil in there. And we're going to sit here and we're going to cycle this knife till it gets where it feels really good. The goal is, is to cycle it and do this. That way, by the time the customer gets the knife, it's functioning real good. Now, there'll be some times you may get a knife um, that actually might be a little weak uh, due to shipping and changing. In the humidity, some of these, especially natural material, the the bone may grow or shrink, and it can cause a defect in it a little bit, but you just have to sit here and break them back in. So that one feels pretty good. Got a good action to it. See that sticking right there? We don't want that. It should pull. But we're going to do it a few more times. Alright, so now we'll move to our main blade, which is the clip point on this knife. And we're going to cycle it a few times. Now we got a little drag in the open position. So if we can't break it in, what we're going to have to do is slack this knife. And there it goes. What happens when you pin these together, the pins sometimes swell in the pivot of the tang of the knife, the blade, and it kind of weakens the action a little. And there it is right there. So now we have the knife functioning the way we want it to function. Feels great. Sounds good. And what we're going to do, we'll check for blade play. A little blade play in there. Little, that one's that one's really good. So we're going to tighten up this blade here just a little bit. If you want to zoom in, you can see there's just a little blade play. You can see the oil moving. So we want to get that out of there. And it's a fine line of not getting it too tight, but getting it tight enough. Um, some people don't mind a little blade wiggle. I like to have none. We're going to take it on down some more. Okay, so now it's starting to get a little tight. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to slack this blade a little bit. Basically taking and putting my kick on the anvil. I'm going to hit the corner. Now this blade is harder than the anvil and probably pretty close equal harder than the hammer. So it shouldn't damage the blade. We'll do it that way. We'll hit it over here. What we did is we just created a little slack in there. Because I got a little too tight. And there is a fully functioning Waterville Coultry Cap Muskrat. So our next step will be taking the pins off of the knife and getting the knife cleaned up and everything finally shaped. So we're ready now to clean up our handle on our knife. We have it clamped in here in the vise. And I've stuck some cloth inside the trough of this knife to help kind of keep some of the, de the debris out of there from sanding. You'll see me, I'll start with a 220 cloth back. Then I'll go to a 600 cloth back. And then I will go to a 600 
paperback from straight pulls. So let's go ahead and clean it up now. Got my rod again. We'll just spray some good old 409. And what I'm doing is I'm watching and trying to get all the scratches running the same. Okay, now we'll go to a 600. Looking good. Yep, it is starting to blend in and match. And with the same piece of 600, we're going to go to our racer because it's got a soft back. We're just going to really get in there. Now, this the idea of this is this rubber, a piece of rubber will form, this eraser will form to the knife. And now we're going to finish off some straight pulls. And now we'll cut us a piece of paper. We'll spray it. We're gonna do the same thing, but this one we're gonna do straight pulls. What we're doing is we're making all the scratches match. If you notice, I'm moving across the paper to try to keep with fresh paper. Now we'll just wipe it and look. You can see all the debris down in there, so the cloth helps catch some of it. So now we need to flip it over, do the spine. We'll have to take the tape off to do our spine. And on the spine, since we took it to a 600 on the grinder, we're going to try to start with a 600 cloth back and see how well that works. Generally it's fine. You'll know if you see heavy scratching. So I'm just using the corner of this mat here I have to really get in there. I'm going to pull the paper down and get back some fresh paper. See we got our scratches all running the same. So now what we'll do, we're going to do it long ways. We're just going to try not to hit our high points on our blades. We're just going to clean that spine up. Okay, so now we'll go back to a cloth back. And that will be our final step for cleaning the habits. Now we got our spine. So now what we're going to do is we're going to pull our cloth out. And I like to lean my knife over when I pull it out. It helps drop some of that debris. We'll close our knife. Now it's time to get to the top of the bolsters.
We want to make sure we don't leave no sharp corners. Okay, so now we're going to do one final long pull. We might do two strokes of that. All right, so we have that side dressed. Now we're going to do this side. Taking the corners, making sure they're nice and round. So they don't cut you in the pocket. Now we'll do our finish off with long straight pulls. Todd, you want to show them? So see, we got the back of it, the front of it, and the top of it. So now we have to address these pins. So it's now it's time to take the pins off and do the final touch on the face of the knife. All right, so we're back in the dust room here at the grinder. I want you to notice that we put a fresh new belt on the grinder. We was at 80 grit originally when we was uh, flattening our pins out. But I want you to notice this is a new belt. So I use one belt one time and then we throw them away. We always use fresh belts. For me, if I use fresh belts, I get more consistent work, um, better work, and I'm not finding myself sitting here doing a lot of hand sanding because I'm getting a good clean cut. So you're going to see me with a brand new belt here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take most of these pins off. And then you're going to see me jump up to a 600 grit belt. We're going to use a brand new one for that as well. So we're fixing to take the pins off now and get them really close with a 220. And notice I have the blades taped up. That's just in case I have an accident. Obviously, if I hit my blade on that, it's going to scar it and there wouldn't be much recovering. So let's take the pins off. I do want to say this. You notice we broke the knife in before I took the pins off. If I would have tried to break this knife in after I took the pins off, what would happen is these pins would show their face and work loose. So always break your knives in before you take the pins off, the heads off. So we're going to come in here real careful and we're going to cut these heads off. All right, so now we've progressed up to a 600 grit. Uh, we left off at 220, so now we're going to do the bolsters. Get a good finish on the bolsters and the handle material with a 600 grit. So right now I'm really focused on getting the head cut off this pin flush with the bolsters with a 600 grit. So we'll see how our pin is going now. We'll do some hand sanding to it as well, but right now we're just getting it cut off. So just a interesting tidbit. This is what CPM 154 still looks like when it comes in. Matt cuts this with his bandsaw, and then he grinds it to the complete blade shape as he begins the process, ultimately, of assembling the knife. Now, he's getting close to finish here, but I thought I would show you what a piece of this, 
this raw steel looks like. This is where it all starts. It's amazing the attention to detail, the amount of work. Even before we started videotaping, there was a lot of work that went into this knife, but we're getting to see those finishing touches. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. And it's what a blessing it's been to be in a knife shop of Matt Collum, Lira, Alabama. All right, so now we've got the knife finished. I got it wrapped up in this rag. Now we got to do some cleaning on it, but we'll do the final cleaning after I get it sharpened. So now we're going to take the knife and sharpen it. I'll use a wicked edge instead of freehanding it or uh, sharpening it off the grinder. I like, I really like this system. It gives me a good professional cutting edge and it makes the knife overall look really good. So we'll get it set up and we'll start sharpening the knife. So you put tape over your over the trough, trough so that when you sharpen it, you don't get dust or grit or anything inside yeah. the trough. Yeah, we don't want no metal grit in there because it'll it'll affect the action on the wall for the spring, and uh, you'll start getting golden if you ain't careful. Yeah, It'll be like sandpaper in there. Awesome. It looks like Matt is using the Wicked Edge system to sharpen the Waterville. Muskrat. Take some finesse. Went from the 400 grit, looked like, to what, 600 or 800? It went to the 600, 400 and 600, and now we're going to go to the 800 and the 1,000 on diamond stones. Diamond stones, okay. Now we're doing the 800. So earlier when you were sanding getting the edge, that was the 400? Uh, the 100 and the 200. Okay. But the one right before this was the 4 and 600. Okay. Now we'll do the 1,000. What degrees are you using? So a 21 on the cutting edge, and then I'll strop at a 23. That'll put me right on the tip of that cutting edge to strop. Now I'm going to move my arms out to 23 degrees. The idea behind that is I'm just riding that burr, nothing that. So we set to 23. We're going to move up to a micron. We'll start with a three and a half micron. These we will strop going up. Ground with a five micron finish. Awesome. All right, and the wicked edge, so that's about six hundred and fifty dollars with the upgrades. That'll include the 800 and 1,000, as well as the, uh, the, kangaroo strops. the kangaroo strops. How long will those things last before you have to replace Ooh. those? I've done made over 200 knives with them. Okay. I've sharpened, over, I've sharpened over 200 knives. So it's not like the belts. They, no, they will last longer. They last longer. So you're using the 200 or 100? 100 right now. Okay. I'm cutting in the ninth. I'm cutting in the secondary bevel with it. Really just roughing it in right now. Getting that bird to lay over. And you'll go you'll do that same thing with a two hundred? Well what we'll do is we'll we'll do straight runs with this one hundred and we'll flop it to two hundred and do straight runs. So I only have to really grind with the one hundred to get a burst out of it. Okay. So we're gonna run through it one more time. Make sure everything's even. So notice how I'm coming straight off of it. Yep. The purpose of that is to keep from rounding that tip of that blade. You're I, you're going up as you're pushing. Yes, coming up off of it. If I come around like that, what I'm going to do is start rounding and sharpening in that knife, and it'll start rolling that blade. Mm. So it's best to come right up off of it. 
now we'll go to a four, which is the yellow side. And when I'm ready for 600, I just turn it to 600. Okay, so here now we're with finished product of the muskrat cap that I made for Waterville Cutlery. Um, this is finished product. One of my favorite patterns. I believe it'll be yours too. Nice walk and talk. We got ebony wood handles on here. And we have a uh, hand satin finish over the all of the whole knife. I want you to notice it comes with a one cliff and it comes with a clip point blade. This is one of my own patterns and one I'm very proud to be able to release to Waterville Cutlery. So here we go, folks. Uh, a beautiful cap muskrat custom made by Matt Collum for Waterville Cutlery. This is our first year, 2023. There's only going to be 10 of these made in the world. You can visit watervillecutlery.com for more information to see if there are still some available by the time you see this video. Uh, the, this knife will be released at the Atlanta Blade Show this June in 2023. So you can look that up. Come out and see us. Uh, this knife will be on display there, and you'll get a chance to look at it, feel it, hear the walk and talk. Matt did a fantastic job. All the attention to details. The little videos that you watched along the way, this was the knife he was working on. Now it's a finished product. This one I'm keeping. It's part of my personal collection. The other nine are available. Some of those have already sold uh, before they were ever made, but there's still a few available as at least the time we're shooting this video. So check us out, watervillecutlery.com. Check out Matt Collum. There's a link to his website on our website. So come see us and Happy knife collecting.